Hey guys, this is Dodoid. So today we're continuing our SGI history series. If you don't know what this series is, I suggest you watch the previous episodes, but basically we're taking a look at the history of silicon graphics from the beginning to the end. In today's episode, we'll be looking at the mid-90s, when, interestingly, they didn't actually release any major products. Still, it's a really fascinating piece of their history, so let's get right into that. We return to our story on the day the first SGI Indy was delivered to a customer in 1993. As the low-end machine, nobody expected it to perform as well as the Indigo 2 or Onyx, but most people expected it to at least run its own operating system acceptably. Unfortunately, it didn't. To keep the price low, SGI decided last minute to ship the Indy with 16 megabytes of RAM in base models, making the much more reasonable 32 megabytes optional. Programmers had been told they were developing for a 32 megabyte system, and had no time to adapt their software for 16 megabytes. Because because the hardware was so new, only the latest IREX version, IREX 5, was compatible. IREX 5 was, as detailed in a now infamous leaked internal SGI memo entitled Software Usability 2, poorly written. To quote the memo, Release 5.1 is a disappointment. Performance for common operations has dropped 40% from 4.0.5. We shipped with 500 priority 1 and 2 bugs, and a base indie is much more sluggish than a Macintosh. Try to do some real work on a 16 megabyte indie. Case closed. SGI quickly killed the 16 megabyte Indy, replacing it with an identically priced but far more expensive to produce 32 megabyte version. At the same time, SGI software developers were working hard on fixing bugs and removing bloat. Though it was a rough start, the Indy would go on to be one of SGI's best selling systems as well as one of their best known. While SGI's rapid fire product launches up until 1993 may make this hard to believe, SGI's product line remained almost exactly the same until 1996. While these years are considered to be SGI's heyday and certainly saw plenty of sales, from a technology standpoint, the only real changes were the introduction of the MIPS R8000 in 1994, and impact graphics for the Indigo 2 in 1995. While SGI didn't release many of their own products during this time, it's worth noting that SGI did work closely with Nintendo to develop what was then known as Project Reality. Initially planned to come in both arcade and home console variants, it would eventually develop into the Nintendo 64. SGI systems were also used for N64 game development. Returning to the Indigo 2, it had initially done well. It had more RAM than the Indy, so IREX bloat and memory leaks didn't affect it as much, and the later improved software that made the Indy usable made the Indigo 2 even better. Everything was fine until January 1996, when SGI's new R10,000 Indigo 2 was released. The NEC-made R10,000 CPUs used in the machines had a bug, which would on occasion cause the system to shut down unexpectedly. Despite only 4,000 R10,000 Indigo 2s having been sold, replacing them all with working units cost SGI $10 million. In February 1996, SGI announced their purchase of Cray for a price of $740 million. Cray was a supercomputer company, and at the time, their latest product was the Cray SuperServer CS6400. SGI didn't like the product, and opted to sell it and the entire Super Server division to Sun for an undisclosed amount estimated to be around $60 million. Sun began development on a successor to the CS6400 under the codename Starfire, and in 1997 the product launched as the Sun Ultra Enterprise 10,000. After the product launched, Sun CEO Scott McNeely was quoted as saying that the CS6400 was the best tech industry investment since Microsoft acquired DOS. Meanwhile, SGI still owned the rest of Cray, and they weren't particularly bothered by the CS6400. The Cray development teams that they had acquired were set to work on developing a new way to interconnect systems, which eventually became CrayLink, later NumaLink. CrayLink allowed multiple systems to be linked together into a single computer running one IRIX installation with up to 512 processors by use of router boards and a large helping of cables. So that was part three of SGI history. Like I said, no product launches, but actually really interesting. So if you did like the video, then please do consider subscribing as we're still quite a small channel. And uh, until next time, thanks for watching. Bye.